Hey everybody, we have multi-D intubation rounds today. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about preparing for an intubation, the things you wanna think about having in the room with you, everything you need to do, and then I'm gonna have Mavis take over. What are you gonna talk about, Mavis? Hi everybody, I'm going to talk about the nursing implications uh, before intubation and during intubation so nurses are familiar with uh, what to do to help the doctor. All right, let's get rocking. All right, so um, I use an acronym that means nothing and says nothing, but I learned it at Baltimore Shock Trauma 15 years ago, and I'm not letting it go. We're just gonna keep using it. So credit goes to them uh, for my dear friend Scamlani. It means nothing. Don't think it means anything, um, but it is my way of remembering every single time what I need to bring in the room. I promise you, if you use a checklist and talk to everyone around you, this whole procedure is gonna go infinitely better than if you don't. So this is the way I do it. So my S stands for suction. Uh, for me, that means checking my suction canister. It means having my yank hour. It means testing my yank hour to see if I have enough suction going on it. Um, and it means tucking it right under where my hand is gonna go, uh, right under the mattress, so that it is right there and I don't have to look and I know where it's gonna be every time. The next thing is a CO2 detector, um, whether that is um, a little one that you're gonna put on it that's gonna change in color or whether that's gonna be capnography. Um, it doesn't matter as long as you have some way to detect CO2. Um, the other thing that I'm gonna add on to this, which we don't generally think about outside the world of COVID, is I want you to have a viral filter. And I'm just putting those together because those are two things that we think about um, putting right on uh, the tube as we're getting going. So don't forget about a viral filter, uh, both for um, pre-intubation and as you're getting ready to go. All right, my O is oxygen. This sounds really obvious and straightforward, but when you're about to intubate someone, it's usually because they've decompensated, and in the room, you may have a nasal cannula, and a face mask, and a non-rebreather mask, and a CPAP mask, and a high-flow nasal cannula. And you just wanna check it all and make sure what you think is hooked up to the oxygen is what's hooked up to the oxygen. So take your bag valve mask, track it back, take everything and make sure that you get rid of whatever spaghetti you can uh, to keep things as clear as possible to so your oxygen. Your M is your monitor. You just wanna make sure that you can see this as you're doing procedures. So if something starts beeping at you, you don't get nervous, you can look right up and see what's going on. My L is my laryngoscope. I branch this out even one step further to go laryngoscope or glide scope, which really uh, video laryngoscopy is gonna be the plan here for the most part. And then I want you to also have secondary and tertiary options here that you're gonna talk through with the whole team. So everybody knows, based on what you see when you go on that airway, what they need to get you next, what the next step is, what you're thinking about. So for me, it's laryngoscope, well, it's gonna be GlideScope first for COVID patients, and then I'm gonna think about an LMA if I get in trouble, um, or a bougie potentially, um, just thinking about that, and then if I'm really having trouble, we're gonna to need to get a surgical airway in there, so keeping that in mind. So just knowing what you're gonna do and making sure the whole room knows what your plan is. Okay. Um, the next thing is airway. So here, I'm talking about my ET tube, the correct stylet that goes with your ET tube, I want you to keep in mind. But I'm also talking about nasopharyngeal airways, and oropharyngeal airways. You wanna make sure that you have all of those things available to you. And then next step is gonna be your drugs. So Mavis, what types of drugs do we need to have ready for intubation? Definitely sedation. Okay, perfect. So I call those induction agents. What else? Vasopressors. Perfect. One other type of drug, do you know? Uh, paralytics. Perfect. Okay, so I generally think of three types of induction agents. Okay, I think about propofol. I think about automidate. And I think about ketamine. Okay, 
So for propofol, the big downside is that you can get a big drop in blood pressure if you're using propofol. So if you're already having blood pressure difficulty, make sure you're thinking about that. Our propofol dose, um, we can have anywhere from one to two, we'll say two milligrams per kilogram around there for your dose of propofol. For automidate, we're gonna use 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. Downside of automidate is we know that um, we can get adrenal insufficiency as a side effect of using automidate, so something to keep in mind. And then ketamine, one milligram per kilogram. The nice thing about ketamine is you're not gonna get the blood pressure effects that you would get with propofol. So choose one, uh, make sure it's appropriate for your situation. You definitely need an induction agent unless your patient's really completely out already. Um, no better way to find out if they're really out than to put a laryngoscope in there. They'll let you know. Okay. The next thing is paralytics. There's three things that I think about in this category. First is succinylcholine. Next is rocuronium. And then vecuronium is the other. So vecuronium is 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. Rock is one milligram per kilogram. And then sucks, we're gonna do one to two milligrams per kilogram. Now you don't absolutely need a paralytic when you intubate somebody. I generally like to have it, I almost always use it. Um, it makes me feel safer in the procedure, but whatever the physician wants um, is okay. Keep in mind with sucks, if you have any hyperkalemia at all, it's gonna get worse with sucks and it can lead to arrest. So we don't want to use sucks in anybody who has trauma, burn injuries, hyperkalemia, anything of the sort. Okay. The rock and vec are going to act a little longer than your sucks will. So it can be a problem if you're unable to get your airway, it can lead to a little bit more of a uh, urgent situation because you're not going to get your respiratory drive back. As long as that's not a problem in the ICU when we intubate someone, we're intubating them for the long haul. So it's generally okay if it lasts longer. Okay. And then pressors. So what we're doing when someone's intubated or about to intubate, we're taking someone who's using every ounce of adrenaline they have in their body to keep breathing. And we're taking that away. We're taking away all their fight and we're giving them drugs that cause low blood pressure anyway. So absolutely have phenylephrine or norepinephrine ready to go before you even start this. Okay. So one from each category, you're gonna pick there as far as your drugs go. And then IV is gonna be your last thing. And you wanna make sure that this is a free flowing IV that's working well, you have a bag of fluid ready to go. This can't be a 22 in your pinky that's been there for a week, right? You wanna make sure that this is really flushing and ready to go. Um, so those are the big considerations of things we wanna make sure we have in hand before you go in the room and you wanna think about taking as few people in the room with you as possible, okay? Can you talk about the nursing considerations for us? Absolutely. Yep. I think I'll set this right here. Hi everyone, just to tell you a few things. Uh, so before uh, the patient is intubated, sometimes nursing, uh, you guys are the first ones in the room before the physicians or providers. So a few things you might wanna help with when you go in the room is to one, pull out the bed so the provider has room to get behind the patient's head and, and intubate. Another thing you might wanna do obviously is to start bagging the patient. Um, get extra nurses in uh, to help you and you can go ahead and start bagging the patient. Have someone outside the room, call the respiratory therapist and um, also make sure that you have a dedicated medication line going to that patient so you can get that patient the medications that the physician just talked about um, because you don't want to give those medications with other things that might be incompatible such as uh, if heparin is running through the IV line or something like that. Um, a few things to consider for nurses to consider after intubation. Of course, uh, after the patient is successfully intubated um, and the physician inflates the ET tube cuff, you want to listen to breath sounds bilaterally, ensuring that they're equal on both sides. Um, you also want to call outside the room and ask for a chest x-ray. And uh, you also want respiratory therapy there to check the ET tube cuff pressure for you. Um, and also after all of that, um, you can also, you'll also need to get restraints because when the paralytics wear off the patient, the patient will probably start to move if, it, if the sedation is not adequate. So you want to get restraints. Okay, mm -hmm. everything Mavis said is 100% correct. I just want to remind everybody that we're, it's a little bit of a different beast we're talking about with COVID now. 
So we do not wanna do any extra aerosolization with these folks. So this is gonna be a true rapid sequence intubation. So we wanna make sure we're not uh, bag valve masking our patients. So we wanna get some oxygen flow and we want to do the RSI as quickly as possible. Um, so for COVID specifically, don't be bagging them. Um, everybody else, fine to go ahead and bag ahead of time, um, get people pre-oxygenated as much as possible. Okay, so um, the other thing I want everyone to think about, again, there's no way around it. Intubation is an aerosolizing procedure. Um, we're trying to minimize that by not bagging, but it still is. And so please, please, please make sure you're protected um, when you go in the room, whatever your hospital protocol is. Um, absolutely, this is a time for a papper. Um, this is a time to do the right thing um, for a, a dangerous procedure, okay? So keep that in mind. Uh, thank you all for everything you're doing, um, and let me know if you have any questions. See ya. Bye.